little concerned because we're running an experiment that focuses on pedestal physics, but uh, I don't know how that's been going today. Okay, well, maybe it's about time for us to get going. Yes. Good. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the May 17th edition of the SoCal uh, FAPP seminar series. Today, we're very happy to have Dr. Tess Bernard with us from General Atomics. She is currently a staff scientist at GA in the Theory and Computational Science Group. Uh, previously, she had got her PhD working at the University of Texas, Austin, and she did her research by developing and testing and comparing models against the Texas Helimac which is a relatively simple magnetized torus experiment at UT Austin. After graduate school, well, she also did some research uh, while in graduate school at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. And then after graduate school, I uh, took a postdoc through, uh, at General Atomics through the Oak Ridge Associated Universities, and uh, then became a full science, full-time scientist. Her main interests are in the areas of modeling edge plasmas, infusion devices, and validating those against experimental data. So thanks for the advanced test. Go ahead, it's all yours. Thanks for the introduction, George. And I'm very happy to be here today to present to you my work on the effects of neutral interactions in gyro kinetic simulations of magnetized boundary plasmas. I'd first Sorry, like I'm not to- We're not seeing your share screen yet. Oh, but, uh, yeah. yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, now you see it? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, so thanks again for having me, and I'd like to start by thanking my co-authors who assisted with this work. So most of us here are well aware that magnetic confinement fusion has the potential to provide clean and abundant renewable energy. However, controlled exhausts of heat and particles is essential for the success of a fusion power plant. So here's a cartoon of a fusion pilot plant. So we know that the uh, fusion process is occurring in the hot, dense core. But then we also have this critical issue of a high amount of heat and particles to the plasma facing components, and they have to be able to withstand those high fluxes. So we need to exhaust those in an effective and safe manner. Furthermore, we also have neutral particles, which are present via neutral beam injection for fueling, gas puffing for fueling, and diagnostics and recycling. And then recycling, you have ions impacting either the diverter or wall, recombining with an electron and returning as a neutral. And these neutrals impact plasma dynamics as well as exhaust properties. In the scrape off layer, that's the region outside the last closed flux surface. It's an open field line region and it sets boundary conditions for the core and determines how heat and particles are exhausted. And therefore it's important to understand plasma turbulence and other dynamics in this region and to have accurate and computationally efficient modeling. Also in this region, we have blobs or blob filaments and these are coherent turbulent structures of elevated pressure. They're along, dated, along field lines, um, but then they have a smaller shape perpendicular to the field lines. These drift radially across field lines. So you can see here from this gas puff imaging diagnostic on the NSCX tokamak, an image of a blob moving radially outward towards the wall. So these can be beneficial in that they might broaden the scrape off layer width, reducing flux to the diverters, but they can also introduce impurities by interacting with the main chamber wall, which can degrade the quality of the plasma. Therefore, it's necessary to understand how neutrals imp impact plasma profiles, turbulence, heat flux width, and other properties in the scrape off layer. And so that's the goal in this research. So here's an overview of what I'll be presenting. I have a continuum. I'm presenting a continuum kinetic neutral transport model that has been coupled to a continuum gyro kinetic code in scrape off layer simulations to probe the effects of neutrals on plasma dynamics. So in the first part of the talk, I'll break down some of what this means by kinetic neutral transport model and the gyro kinetic model and how these models are implemented in the Jekyll code that I've used to produce, produce these results that I'll show. And the bulk of the talk will be on the proof of concept NSTX scrape off layer simulations. And next I will show seeded blob simulations with D3D parameters. And this was carried out with Sully student Emily Humble last summer 
And then finally, I'll have conclusions and an outlook. So first, just a little bit about, a little bit of background on JAR kinetic models. So JAR kinetic models um, are used by averaging over the fast cyclotron motion and evolving a particle guiding center density instead of the particle itself with a distribution function that's five dimensions. So three spatial dimensions and two velocity space dimensions plus time. So instead of evolving a particle, you're basically evolving a charged ring. And this type of model is valid for strongly magnetized plasmas where your gyro radius, your ion gyro radius is much less than your length scales of interest or your frequencies your, are, are of interest are much less than your ion cyclotron frequency. And then length scales in the parallel direction are much longer than length scales in the perpendicular direction of turbulent structures and so forth. And then k per rho i is of order one. Jar kinetic models have been widely used in, core and pedis, in the core and pedestal. And in these regions, your perturbations to the background distribution function, um, the magnitudes are typically much less than the, the background distribution function, which is usually modeled with a Maxwellian. And these are called delta F codes. They include gene, gyro, C gyro, GS2, and they're very effective at um, modeling turbulence and micro instabilities in the core and pedestal. However, when you move out to the scrape off layer, you have perturbations that are of order the background distribution function. And so it's necessary to use full F jar kinetic codes. And some of these include XGC, which has been developed at PBPL. You can see an example of some results from that code shown here on the left, as well as Cogent developed at um, Lawrence Livermore and Jekyll also developed at PBPL. And this work focuses on the Jekyll code. Traditionally, fluid models have been used to model the scrape off layer, but in, in this region, the mean free paths are not always small enough to justify Bruginsky fluid closure. And so flux, and also kinetic flux limiting is important. So uh, kinetic models become necessary to get very accurate results. Now a little bit of background about um, kinetic models. So both fluid and kinetic models are used for neutral transport in the scrape off layer. However, similar to fluid codes uh, for plasmas, Fluid models are only valid when neutral mean free paths are much less than length scales of interest. But neutral mean free paths can vary from centimeters to over a meter and blob widths, which are a good um, typical length scale for the scrape off layer are on the order of centimeters. Therefore, kinetic Monte, Monte Carlo neutral codes are widely used. These include Sulpius Eater and Dega2, and they include a vast array of atomic and molecular physics. Here's an example from Sulpius Eater of neutral pressure in the scrape off layer. It ha um, however, these um, codes such as Sulpius Eater often couple to simple transport models for plasma that may miss crucial, crucial physics. And furthermore, statistical noise in Monte Carlo codes presents difficulties when coupling to Eulerian turbulence codes. Therefore, for th that type of coupling, it's important to use a continuum kinetic model instead. So many plasma turbulence codes now include models for neutrals. And I've listed a number of those examples shown here, grouping them by the type of plasma model, either fluid or gyrokinetic, and the type of neutral model, either kinetic or fluid. And so this work focuses obviously on the coupling within Jekyll. And we've coupled a continuum gyrokinetic solver with a continuum kinetic solver. And like I mentioned previously, this continuum coupling avoids the noise issues and it also achieves improved accuracy for a given resolution at a reasonable computational cost. But that's not to say that these other codes are extremely important and useful. For example, XGC couples a PIC gyrokinetic model to Monte Carlo neutral code, either the native um, model or to Dega2. And it's important to have different models to cross check one another. So now I'm go going to just describe a little bit more about the Jekyll framework. So it's a computational framework for modeling fusion, astrophysical and space plasmas, as well as neutral fluids. And in this work, we're using the full F continuum jar kinetic solver for modeling open field line plasmas with conducting sheath boundary conditions. And it includes capabilities for magnetic fluctuations and shear. 
as well as general geometry capabilities for scraped soles, but currently without the X point. And there is also capabilities for closed field line simulations, which are being tested. And it's been used to model tokamak scrape off layers from NSTX, Aztex, D3D, and LTX, as well as basic plasma devices, such as the LAPD device and the Texas UMAC. And in this work, we've used the Vlasov solver to adapt. Uh, the Vlasov solver has been adapted to model neutrals, and it's been coupled to the gyrokinetic model using Jekyll's modular app system. So I'm briefly going to just go over some of the equations that are used in our model. So for the plasma, we're using a full F electrostatic gyrokinetic equation in the long wavelength limit. So here is the gyrokinetic equation, so the dynamical equation for the evolution of the distribution function in five dimensions. And so you have three spatial dimensions, two velocity space dimensions will so be parallel along the field line and then the magnetic moment mu for the perpendicular velocity. The Hamiltonian shown in the second line and note that we're using the true electrostatic potential as opposed to a gyro average potential since at this point in time, we don't include FLR effects. And then the system is closed with a gyrokinetic Poisson equation and in this case, the polarization term is constant in time and space, much like the Boussinesque approximation used in fluid models. And for the neutral dynamics, we're using the Vlasov solver. And we've included electron impact ionization and charge exchange via these collisional terms on the right-hand side. So for the electron impact ionization, you have an electron colliding with a neutral ionizing it and producing two lower energy electrons. And in charge exchange, you have a neutral and an ion exchanging an electron with one another. We also have wall recycling included as a boundary condition in the parallel direction. And for wall recycling, you have an ion colliding, um, impacting a diverter or end plate, recombining with the electron coming back as a neutral. And um, all of this can, is summarized in our recent POP paper. And another detail about this coupling, um, these, so the plasma species and the neutrals are evolved on two different phase space grids. So that means they share the configuration or the physical space, but have different velocity space grids. So the gyrokinetic grid is just two, so D parallel and the magnetic moment mu, whereas the Vlasov grid has three velocity space coordinates. And then we're using a fluid, uh, fluid moments to project ion and neutral distribution functions as Maxwellians onto the other grid. So Jekyll uses an advanced computational method called the discontinuous Galerkin method, and it includes a lot of really great conservation properties, but it's actually non-trivial to um, interpolate between two different phase-based grids and maintain those conservation properties. So that's important um, future work, but for the time being, we're using this Maxwellian approximation and so that's highlighted in these neutral collision terms on the right-hand side. So this first equation is the electron equation and we have the ionization collision term shown here. So this term represents the two lower energy electrons that are resulting from that process. And then in the ion equation, you have first the ionization term and then the charge exchange. And then in the neutrals, you have again, also the ionization charge exchange terms. And these, this model has been um, verified with um, against analytic theory and also benchmarked with the Degas to Monte Carlo neutral code. So now I'm going to introduce the NSCX scrape off layer simulations. So first we have a assumed a simplified geometry, what we call a simple helical scrape off layer. So we assume a constant curvature and magnetic field connection length. We don't include shear or an X point and we're only including open field lines. So to help you visualize this, here's a cartoon of a tokamak. And so you see this field line in the scrape off layer winding helically around the torus. So in a simple form, you can imagine it just winding helically in this vertical direction. And then we also, so we have a field line following coordinate system in the code. So to help visualize that, here's a cross section of the NSCX device 
and this is the script off layer region that we are simulating. So you can imagine straightening that out. Then you have Z, which is the direction parallel to the magnetic field shown vertically here. And we apply conducting sheath boundary conditions at either direction, at either end. And those boundary conditions, uh, they partially reflect electrons. So electrons that are um, able to overcome the uh, pre-sheath potential are, uh, they exit the, the domain and then the lower energy electrons are reflected and ions free stream out of the domain. X is the radial coordinate and we apply Dirichlet boundary conditions in the X direction. And those are also called the um, conducting wall boundary conditions. And then Y is our bi binormal coordinate and we use periodic boundary conditions in that direction. So for the simulations themselves, we have a simulation with neutrals that we compare to a baseline case without neutrals. And these are based on uh, previous NSTX simulations with a connection length of eight meters, a radial box width of 50 rho s. And um, we're assuming we're simulating deuterium plasma and we're using the electrostatic dark kinetic solver to model the electron and ion species in five dimensions. So we're using a particle and heat source to mimic the heat source that happens at the midplane in the tokamak and flows across the separatrix into the scrape off layer. But as I mentioned previously, these are all open field lines. So we don't have a real separatrix, but we can separate the source region from the scrape off layer region to the right by this dashed white line, which I'm calling the quasi separatrix. And then we are simulating the neutrals with the 6D Vlasov solver. We're including wall recycling with a recycling rate of 95% and a recycling temperature of 10 EV. And so those are applied in the Z direction, so same as the sheath boundary conditions. And then for radial boundary conditions for the neutrals, we have um, absorbing boundary conditions on the inner wall to represent neutrals that leave the domain, go into this core-like region. And then we have perfectly reflecting boundary conditions on the outer wall. So we're not including um, main chamber wall recycling at this time, though that is a very important piece of physics we plan to include in the future. And we're including ionization and charge exchange interactions. And then we have a volumetric particle source floor for neutrals to approximate the recombination rate since we don't directly include a recombination model at this point in time. And so now we can look at the dynamic evolution of the density. So it's shown here is the electron density. So what? So this here's a little uh, visual aid of what we're looking at. So here's that field line that I showed earlier. Now we're viewing it at the midplane and perpendicular to the magnetic field. Um, so the field line's coming out of the screen. So we have the case with neutrals, so only the jar kinetic species. And for those fami familiar with tokamak physics, this is simil similar to a closed diverter scenario. You can think of it that way. So you don't have the neutrals penetrating up to the midplane. On the other hand, with neutrals, in which we've coupled to the blast of neutrals with the 95% recycling rate, you can think of this like an open diverter scenario where you have neutrals penetrating up from the end plates to the midplane. And these simulations are run to 0.4 milliseconds, so that's about four ion transit times. And the case with neutrals took about five times longer than the case without neutrals. And so this type of uh, computational cost is still very reasonable considering these are two coupled kinetic codes and there's uh, still room for optimization, which is ongoing in Jekyll as we're moving to a new version of the code. And so here, looking from left to right, you see the case without neutrals. And as you'll notice, once it evolves, there's a steeper density gradient. Um, in the case with neutrals, the background density as it approaches the quasi steady state is flatter. And then something too, which seems anomalous is this high neutral density on the inner wall and on the inner wall of the um, boundary or the, the domain. And that's due to this conducting wall boundary condition for the plasma. So obviously the plasma would not go to zero as it's doing here. Um, and as it goes to zero in the simulation, then the ionization is no longer happening. And so the neutral density increases. 
And then also keep in mind that if we had a um, main chamber wall recycling, the neutral density should rise as it, as it moves out radially. Um, but there's still a lot of interesting physics that we can observe even with these um, limiting assumptions. And so now moving along to some of the quasi steady state profiles, um, we're taking a look at the mid plane. And then for reference, I've just included a grayed out region to represent that source region. The dashed black line is that quasi separatrix. And then uh, we're more interested in the profiles and dynamics in this scrape off layer region to the right of that. So as we might expect by including ionization and keeping the mid, mid plane source uh, the same for the both for both cases. The case with neutrals has a much higher density, about a factor of three higher. Um, and then we're also observing density flattening. So when you um, normalize these to their respective maximum density, plot them on a log scale, you see that the case with neutrals is much flatter. And this is similar to experimental observations of the so-called density shoulder, um, and also observations with with GBS. And then you can also see differences in temperature. So with those neutral interactions, uh, the ion and electron temperatures decrease through the charge exchange and ionization processes respectively. And so we can also look at the pressure profiles, which because of the decrease in the temperature um, are much more similar than the density profiles were. And then because this uh, open field line simulation has bad curvature everywhere, the uh, curvature drive is the main turbulent drive in these simulations. And as a proxy for that, we can calculate the interchange growth rate. And that's shown in this middle plot. So you can see that that's reduced for the case with neutrals. And then there's a corresponding decrease in the normalized density fluctuations shown on the right-hand plot. Next, we can look at the different flows and fluxes. So in this first plot, we've normalized the radial flux to the background density. And we find this decreases with neutrals. Similarly, there's a decrease in the normalized uh, parallel electron particle flux. And so this decrease in the parallel flow could be contributing to that density flattening. So as the parallel flow becomes less efficient. And then we also see a small decrease in the E cross B flow magnitudes in both the, the radial direction shown in the solid line and then the binormal direction in the dotted line, the dashed line. Next, we can measure and compare the parallel heat flux. So this is calculated at the upper end plate. It's the sum of ion and electron contributions. And the profiles have been fit to an exponential to estimate the width at the quasi separatrix. And we find that the neutrals slightly decrease the width of the parallel heat flux as well as the magnitude. And then we can also calculate the power balance in these simulations. So they both have the same input power but in the case without neutrals, the only power loss is through the parallel heat flux to the end plates. And summing those contributions gives the orange line, which approaches zero, thanks to the conservative properties of the Jekyll algorithms. And when you include the neutral interactions, there's a small source of losses due to the ionization and charge exchange interactions. And then the uh, magnitude of the, the loss is slightly reduced, shown in green and those sum to the purple curve, which also approaches zero. Next, we can investigate some of the turbulence properties. So here I've calculated skewness and excess kurtosis. So these are calculated from probability density, fun uh, density functions of the density fluctuations. And the skewness is a calculation of the third moment of the PDF. And it's a measure of, just like it sounds, the skewedness of the, the PDF, which tends to skew positive in um, intermittent turbulence situations as one would find in blobby turbulent um, scrape off layers. And then the excess kurtosis, which is the fourth, related to the fourth moment is more, uh, is a measure of the tailedness. So in these, um, scrape off layer scenarios with blobby turbulence. Um, the excuness and kurtosis are measurements of the intermittency and they tend to be positive. And so these are, when we include neutrals, those are reduced. And this is primarily because of that higher background density 
that we observe. So the, the deviations from the background are smaller than in the cases with, um, without neutrals. And then we also compared the radial correlation length, which mostly similar, um, but then deviates at higher radii. <clears throat> and then the autocorrelation time is a bit higher for the case with neutrals, suggesting um, possibly longer temporal coherence of the blobs. And so speaking of blobs, we can investigate those dynamics a bit further. We have a blob tracking algorithm that we've used to identify blobs by density contours that are two standard deviations above the background density. And in the case with neutrals, we observed there were about 20% more blobs over a 200 microsecond interval, and this is calculated at the midplane. And so here on the these top plots, this is a normalized blob histograms in the case without neutrals and with neutrals. And so this average is shown in the vertical line, and we can see that the case with neutrals has a larger normalized blob size, whereas the radial velocities are very similar for the two cases. And then we can also compare this data to theoretical scaling laws. And um, in this work by Myra et al, there are different regimes for these um, blob velocity scalings. And they are compared by these reference velocities and sizes um, shown, uh, defined here. And so there's uh, two different scalings shown here. So there's a sheath interchange regime and then an ideal interchange regime. And these blobs are likely in the sheath interchange regime. Um, and the case that I've shown is a, is a low collisionality case. We use a reduced collisionality and I'll get into that in a, in a subsequent slide. And then um, it will be necessary to perform scans in collisionality and include general geometry to access some of the other regimes predicted by um, the theoretical literature. Okay, so now I'm going to change gears a little bit. And so if you think back to the comparison of the density profiles and that three, that factor of three difference when we added neutrals, the question we can ask is, well, how much of these differences how, that, how many of these differences that we've observed are just simply due to an increased source? And so what we've done is we've, added an effective ionization source to a case without neutral species. And so we did that by first looking at the um, case with neutrals on the right-hand side. Um, this has both the midplane source that's identical in both and an average ionization source, um, which you can see at the end, at the, the end plates in Z. And so we approximated those with um, analytic functions and we were able to actually reproduce a lot of the differences, but not all. Um, so some of the differences that persist are this density flattening at higher radii. And it is possible that you know, we, we're not perfectly capturing this ionization source here at the midplane at the larger radii, um, but this is still pretty significant. Uh, temperatures are very similar, um, parallel flux very similar, but it's still a little decreased for the case with neutrals. So that could also be contributing um, to this density flattening. And then pressure also similar and then slight reduction in, in the density fluctuations. Um, so we can conclude that, that a lot of those differences can be accounted for by this increased source. But looking into the blob dynamics, we see uh, more noticeable differences actually. So the simulation with neutrals um, has about 25% more blobs compared to the case with an ionization source and no neutrals. And in this case, the blobs are both larger here and also slower than in the previous um, comparison. So we can conclude that the charge exchange collisions play a role in um, these larger and slower blobs since we've attempted to isolate that by adding that effective ionization source. And then lastly, on the NSTX simulation results, I just want to go over uh, some differences uh, due to, or uh, some different simulations run with different collisionalities. So in Jekyll, the plasma collisions are modeled with the Leonard bernstein collision operator. And 
uh, using a constant Spitzer collision frequency that's been calculated from input parameters. And so the simulations that I showed previously with the neutrals used a reduced collisionality for faster computation. Um, so these are approaching collisionless um, scenarios with mean free paths much longer than, uh, than quite a bit longer than the connection length. And so we want to see the effect of, of a higher collisionality. Um, so we compare this um, collisionality that's about 1% of what, it, what the expected collisionality would be and um, 10%. And then these use actually a different recycling rate so that we could reach a steady quasi steady state um, more quickly. And what we found is that the results were actually uh, very similar, except for some minor differences in density, temperature, and blob speed. So we concluded, at least for this comparison, um, the collisionality did not make too much of a difference. Um, and then with, with more computational resources, we obviously want to go to the um, expect, full expected collisionality and also um, a dynamically evolved collision frequency where we, we might be able to observe new features. So I'm just going to briefly summarize these um, NSTX simulation results before moving on to the next section. So including neutrals res resulted in a flatter density profile. Um, these interactions appeared to reduce curvature, normalized density, tur uh, density, turbulence fluctuations, flows, skewness, and excess kurtosis. There were not significant changes to the parallel heat flux width. The case with neutrals had more blobs, which were more uniform in size, um, but have similar average velocities. I isolating the ionization source showed that charge exchange collisions produce some density profile flattening in larger and slower blobs. Um, and then increasing the plasma collisionality had a minor effect. So next is uh, the seated blob simulations with D3D parameters. So these were conducted with static background neutrals and only the charge exchange interaction. Um, so we can kind of use this to compare to the results with the effective ionization source where we really focus more on um, isolating those charge exchange effects. And we have three cases. So no neutrals shown here on the left. Center shows a case with a neutral density that is 1%, excuse me, 10% of the background plasma density. And then finally, a neutral density that's 100% of the background neutral or background plasma density. And we can see that the blobs are more compact as the neutral density is increased. And it's uh, maybe a little bit difficult to see here, but they're also uh, moving more slowly, which I'll show in the next um, slide or two. And so we um, can estimate the radial blob velocity by modeling the blob as a circuit and then using the quasi uh, new neutrality condition, grad J zero. And so blobs, they move radially outward um, according to this model by this internal polarization. So this internal polarization um, creates this uh, radial E cross B drift of the blobs. And so by deriving a radial blob velocity from the quasi neutrality condition, we can get a form of the equation shown here on the right. And the different drives are depicted by the different colors. So first we have the curvature drive up top, and then there's a sheath current damping term and then there's also a neutral charge exchange damping term. And so as a part of Emily's work with this, um, the Suli student who worked with me last summer, she developed a blob uh, velocity tracking algorithm. And the results are shown by these diamonds in this plot on the left. And we compared those to the theoretical predictions um, given by that equation on the previous slide. So there's fair agreement here and less so at the smaller blob size. And so um, we're still investigating the source of those differences. Um, and then, so keep in mind that the equation from the previous slide is derived from a fluid model and we have a jar kinetic model in Jekyll. And then we observe that as the neutral density is increased, so this is the 10%, um, the neutral density that's 10%, the background plasma, and then 100% on the right-hand side, and the binormal electric field magnitude EY decreases. So you can see that their the colors are um, more faded in this right-hand plot. And so that smaller electric field magnitude means a smaller radial um, velocity drive. And this brings me to my conclusions. So today I presented results 
of a continuum kinetic neutral transport model that's been coupled to the continuum dark kinetic code in Jekyll. And so the description of that model, as well as some of those NSTX results that I've shown um, are available in our recent physics of plasma publication. And then including neutrals in the NSTX soil simulations resulted in a flatter density profile, likely due to the reduced flows, um, reduced turbulence fluctuations, skewness, and excess kurtosis. Um, we also observed some larger and more uniform blobs. And then by isolating the ionization source term, um, we concluded that the charge, charge exchange effects contribute to the density, um, may contribute to the density flattening, reduced turbulence levels, and slar, sl larger and slower blobs. The increased plasma collisionality had a minor effect and the seeded blob simulations supported some of those observations from the NSTX simulations, showing that the charge exchange interaction slows the radial blob velocity. And it does this by decreasing the internal blob polarization. And as for ongoing and future work, we have recently carried out some shaped scrape off layer simulations of D3D without neutrals. Um, so an example of this geometry is shown here on the left-hand side. So right now we're doing an inner wall limited geometry. Um, these black points are radial points. So in that field line following coordinate system that we use. And general geometry for neutrals has been implemented and is currently being tested so that we can add neutral species to these shaped scrape off layer simulations of D3D and hopefully validate them eventually with experimental data. And then we'd also like to add models for recombination and impurity radiation to simulate those detached scenarios, which are very important to study. So we work towards really good exhaust properties in these fusion plasmas. And then um, we'd also finally like to develop interpolation scheme to retain all the kinetic effects in this model. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention today. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Tess. A lot of um, virtual clapping going on here. And um, yeah, certainly a, a very important and timely topic as we've begun to realize how much the tail wags the dog in terms of the importance of the boundary and scrape off layer region, its impact on pedestals and Corby uh, performance, which is significant. And also critical to the exhaust, exhaust problem, which I think has been widely recognized as kind of one of the critical issues facing fusion and plasmas. So anyway, this talk is open for questions or comments. If anybody has one, please use the uh, virtual raise hand feature uh, in Zoom. So while people are thinking about it, one, I guess one question that comes to mind is that uh, I'm not really a boundary expert, but I hear a lot about flows, in particular E cross B flows and diverter flows in the boundary region. And just wondering how those are included or how they might impact the results you've been, been showing here? Is that an important effect? Does it affect neutrals as well as the plasma species? Um, should we be, be worried about that? So at least in terms of these um, <clears throat> equations, those or these models, those are included and they um, are calculated through the electrostatic potential. So that's how we're measuring them here. Um, we haven't done any investigation yet into things like zonal flows. Obviously, um, there's been some important work at, at UCSD, in particular on the effect of neutrals on zonal flows. Um, and, and that's something that, that we've discussed doing, and, and that can be done even in simpler geometries. Um, so I don't have any specific answer at this point, uh, but they, they are important. And for things like the uh, density shoulder formation that I mentioned, um, you know, the parallel flow comes into, into play there. So uh, if, if, not, if I've learned anything from these simulations, it's definitely that it's a very complex beast and there's a lot going on and it takes a lot of um, careful effort to dissect what, what is causing what um, in these, in what we're observing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, very good, thanks. Uh, so we have a couple of hands raised. Um, Pat, Pat Diamond. Okay, thank you. thank you. Interesting talk. So I had two questions, at least at least two. Uh, what have you tried to see what happens to the shoulder when you push on the fueling? Because I mean, the thing that stares you in the face is the issue of the density limit. Mm 
which you can't really address with a scrape off layer simulation alone, but there are people with stories about density limits trying to link it to the behavior of the shoulder. So I was wondering if there were any hints emerging, say it would, mm. would be a strong fueling regime. So there's, um, so these aren't the cheapest simulations, but we have been able to do a, a number of different recycling, um, different with different recycling coefficients. And so you do see an increase in the um, in the profiles and, and somewhat in the flattening. But to get to capture the physics that you mentioned, like the density limit, we're probably going to need the um, the full geometry and the close, you know, crossing the separatrix, the closed field line region. Um, and, but yeah, it's a very important question. The other thing too, that's really necessary in these that we don't have yet is the main chamber wall recycling. And with, and that's not possible with the current radial boundary conditions. So the conducting wall boundary conditions, cause there's obviously no plasma going into the wall, but in the shaped plasma scenarios, we have um, boundaries where the, you can have your plasma species um, because of the, the grad B drifts going into the wall. And so we can add that in those simulations and hopefully investigate that a bit more. Hmm. All right. Well, that will be interesting. Of course, ultimately, you need the you need the main plasma. Of course. Uh, second question was on the blobs. Have you have you at all looked at the statistics of the potential or vorticity field? The, I mean, the experiment, you know, obviously the, the blob is something like a density perturbation with a convective cell. Now, the experimentalists, with our chairman in mind, uh, uh, being, being limited souls, can only measure density efficiently. But since you have the simulation, you would be very interested in the statistics of the things like vorticity. And I would, you know, your result on the charge exchange damping, I mean, that points strongly in, in that direction. Yeah, so that's uh, important. We haven't, so obviously with the seeded blob simulations, it's a bit easier, um, you know, because we have this, we can look at the, uh, the electric field. Um, and the vorticity is, is really important. And so there's there's something interesting too in these seeded blob simulations that we discovered. Um, so we were comparing with the fluid model, and this charge exchange, uh, uh, the charge exchange collision enters through this this vorticity and it's perpendicular, and that's not directly in in the gyrokinetic equations. Um, when you take the gyro fluid, when you uh, take the moments of the gyrokinetic equations, and yet we're still seeing a similar effect. So. Um, and like I said, we haven't looked at the vorticity in in the fully turbulent simulations, but that's definitely something that that we want to investigate. And also, like I mentioned, to to find this relationship between you know the fluid the fluid model with like with the vorticity and with the the, the jar kinetic model that we have. So there's still some um, like link that that missing where we don't fully understand the difference yet between the um, simulation results and the theory, uh, theoretical predictions. And so I think, yeah, like the vorticity plays a key role I mean, in that. I think in, in terms for vorticity, I think it's going to be, it, not only will the gyrokinetic equation be important, but also the, the how you handle the polarization charge in mm -hmm. the Poisson equation, right? Because yeah. Yeah. And so like I, like I said, right now we have this, this Boussin-esque like approximation, mm -hmm. and it is important to um, relax that. And there's been a lot of good work with the Drifter Goose reduced Brig and C fluid models to relax that approximation. Um, and that capability is available in Jekyll, but no one has has tested it yet. And, and yeah, I agree with you that that would be a good thing to to test with this. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another question from Rebecca. Hi, um, sorry for the, the bit of a nuts and bolts question, but um, 
in your Vlasov equation for the neutrals, how are you calculating the collision operator in that? Um, for which, well, so I have, I can show those. I do have a couple extra. Um, so for the different interactions, you mean? Yeah. So um, I have the ionization model here. So in this case, um, so typically you're actually calculating that um, if you're doing it rigorously as an integral over velocity space, but we're approximating it with a statistical average. Um, so for this term here in the pointy brackets, we actually use a fitting function that's based on this work by Voronoff. And um, then this form of the equation is actually based on work by Worsal and Ricci. And so this is where we have the, the two lower energy electrons resulting here. So they're modeled by a Maxwellian and there is an ionization um, or thermal, the thermal energy for that is calculated based on the uh, incident electron energy and then the ionization energy that's required for that. Um, and then the form for the ion and the neutral equations are shown here. So those are very simple. Um, would, you, would you also like to see the charge exchange term? Oh, term as well? uh, no, this is great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have other questions or comments? I have one. There's been a lot of interest and excitement lately over the prospects of negative triangularity shaped plasmas. And uh, of course, a big aspect of that seems to be their differences in their near boundary behavior, um, think, uh, potential for lower heat fluxes, things like that. Uh, and other surprises like low or very high LH power thresholds, which may be a good thing. So I'm just wondering, you probably haven't done simulations of negative triangularity, but are you looking into that? Or do you have any insights as to how that might impact scrape off layer transport turbulence? So I've actually set up the simulations. Um, so with the geometry and run them, but there's, uh, for some reason, they're, uh, they, there's, they're much slower, there's a much smaller time step. So there, yeah, the, the different geometry creates something in, in the code that I'm still trying to sort out uh, because that is actually, so this, um, this geometry that I showed here is the corresponding positive triangularity to the negative triangularity case that I've been setting up uh, because yeah, there's not, um, there's still, a lot of open questions about negative triangularity, neg negative triangularity in general, and particularly with the scrape off layer region, because with the earlier um, negative triangularity discharges, you know, there's been C gyro runs and some of the, the core and pedestal um, turbulence codes have been used to investigate that, but less is known about the scrape off layer. So that's definitely something we're planning to, um, to, to study and that we've started. But yeah, at this point, it's, I, I don't yet have any insight as, as to the differences um, in the scrape off layer between these two, but I'm hoping that by this comparison, we'll, we'll gain some of that insight. Okay, <clears throat> well, we'll look very, very forward to those results. It sounds very exciting. Um, I'm not seeing more questions. Um, so maybe I have one, one final one here and that's, um, you mentioned, something about detachment, but I guess that's become a common theme is how that impacts diverter and pedestal performance. So I'm just wondering, uh, in your simulations, have you considered detachment or how does, how does that alter the, you know, the sheath versus, you know, midplane dynamics? Yeah, so for to really model those, well, uh, we need, we need uh, models for impurity radiation. And, and recombination so that you have that, um, you know, basically that cloud of neutrals that's protecting the diverter. Um, so you you're getting to those low temperatures near the diverter plate um, that's providing that buffer for the, the um, flux of, of particles and heat from the core. So really trying to isolate, and separate those two. But um, yeah, at this point, so we're limited um, computationally because it's, uh, with this model computationally expensive to get to the lower temperatures that are required to model um, detachment while simultaneously being able to model the, the temperatures at the midplane that are much higher. Um, so yeah, there's there's a number of improve, improvements that we're, we're considering to be able to, to move towards that because this question of detachment and how um, it can, uh, you can create this, this 
um, situation to, to preserve the, the integrity of the core plasma is, is obviously really important. Would you be able to, like, I guess a, um, an aspect of it is that you no longer have uniform plasma pressure along the peel line, as I understand. Would that be, do your codes assume a uniform plasma pressure or Jekyll? Along the or? field line? Mm -hmm. No. Um, yeah. So we have variations along the field line. Um, that reminded me of something too that I just that I wanted to say, and I forgot. Maybe I'll think of it in, in a sec. There's more questions. Okay. Um, thanks. We do have a couple more questions. Another one from Pat. Go back again. So if I understood you correctly, you were doing conducting sheath boundary conditions. That's right. So there was a, a TTF talk by the Jekyll group exploring different boundary conditions, in particular uh, kind of resistive sheath and things like that to do from a different branch of the uh, of the enterprise. I'm curious if you looked at the effect of that on, on say, uh, your conclusions concerning blobs? I have not, um, but that's a really interesting point uh, because I know some of the folks at Virginia Tech have even uh, been modeling like the inverse sh sheath, um, is that what it's called? The, yeah, the, uh, the negative sheath that, um, so they've been doing, and they have full, they're using also the fully kinetic uh, Vlasov model for some of those investigations. Um, but yeah, that's that's important to to kind of um, change some of the sheath characteristic and see how that that can move um, the blobs from one regime to another. You would think it would free them up. It would right. It would uh, to some extent decouple them or at least weaken the coupling to the boundaries, so mm -hmm. you might get more interesting blob dynamics. But that you know that's a speculation to be evaluated. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that would be a good something good to test too in just the seeded blob simulations. Okay, and we have uh, maybe one final question from Rich Brebner. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks Tess for a nice talk. I'm wondering, I don't know much about Jekyll, I'm wondering is, if it runs purely on the open fuel lines or if there's any chance of crossing the separate tricks to look a little bit what happens between you know interactions on both sides of the separate tricks. So there is currently no um, coupling of the open field line and the closed field line yet within Jekyll, uh, but Mana Francisquez and Noah Mandel, among others, have been um, working on the closed field line simulations and um, with twist and shift boundary conditions. And, and there's there's a paper under review, um, it's either Nuclear Fusion or Journal, no, I think it's JCC, or yeah, or JCP, sorry. Um, and it's on archive as well that that shows that the closed field line, but we haven't yet coupled it to the, the open field line. But that's that's our goal because they're obviously both both important and to also have that that self consistent um, sourcing of heat and particles across the separatrix. Okay, thank you. That's very nice to hear that. I look forward to results someday. <clears throat> yeah, I think Richard's question or uh, question and comment gets to an important point just about how the edge fueling impacts the pedestal and then ultimately the core. And certainly uh, an area has, has been a lot more attention paid to with concern over density limits and cr increasing the pedestal, et cetera, uh, pedestal height, et cetera. Um, great, so uh, with that, I don't see any more questions. So maybe one last time, let's thank our speaker, Tess, virtually. Thanks very much for the, uh, yeah, lots of uh, virtual applause here and thanks for the very nice presentation and look forward to doing some future comparisons with your simulations. Absolutely, so thanks that, for having me. <laughs> yeah, with that, we will adjourn and have a nice couple of weeks and then there'll be another seminar. Thanks again, bye everybody. Bye. Thanks, Tess.